Okay. Our next talk will be from Ilias, and this is the first of a duo of talks that we'll have on a, a similar topic, so you are in for a treat on the future of space flight in open source. Thank so, you. Thank you, Ilias. Okay. So my name is Elias. I am a core contributor at the Libre Space Foundation, and my like job title is doing space stuff. So before we move on, uh, let's get the audience up to speed. In the title, I think there are like two words that may be unfamiliar. So does anyone know what is a, what a pocket cube is? Okay. A pocket cube is a really small satellite. It's like five centimeters, a cube of five centimeters uh, size. So it's this. It's really small. And um, the one P, the one P is the is a one unit for pocket cube. So this is one P. If you go to two P, you extend one time the size. Three P, you extend two times the size. Four P. Uh, it makes no sense, you just go to a bigger satellite. Um, do you know what a deployer is? Most of you? Okay, so uh, rocket people do not uh, like uh, to put your satellite with duct tape on the rocket, so they want a fancy box to put everything in. That's a deployer. And uh, the last term, ah, oh, do you know what LEO is? LEO is low Earth orbit. Starts from around two or three hundred kilometers and go up to like twelve hundred. So, this is the terminology. Let's start our story. So, this is the story of Cubic. Um, so, it was, I think, three years ago, summertime, and uh, we got a phone call. With, it, it was actually an email, and uh, they told us, you know, we have a spot on a rocket in a deployer for one piece satellite, and it's free. And this matters because uh, the cost for launching one of these could be like uh, 15,000 euros, maybe more. So that's a great opportunity. And we said yes. And they said, okay, uh, you have a, a few months to get it ready to go. <laughs> mm, okay. So let's see what we have. We looked around on the space stuff we have. And uh, we have a comms board. That's important. Uh, because like the basic satellite, you need something to communicate with, and you need someone, some source of power. Um, and that's what we had. So it was quite capable. It can do all this modulation and stuff. I won't uh, bore you with it. But it was a starting point. It needed a bit of tweaking. Um, and that's it. So... Um, where are we going? They told us that you're going to an orbit of 300 kilometers. That's nice. Uh, for the weight of, the, of these satellites, you expect to be up there for one to two weeks. Good enough. And uh, it was the first flight of the rocket. Not good enough. <laughs> so we came up with the plan. Um, there was lots of hardware that had to be done. So. We had to test the comms board we had, and then we need a way to add power to it. And even it would be even nicer to be able to not just have a battery that will die and have uh, some solar panels to get extra power. And then all this had to be somehow bind together to form a satellite, and then um, put all this in a plate that can go into the deployer because there are some kind of specifications that re require you to have like a specific shape that goes in there. And then w there were some testings where you put this in an oven and uh, some materials that uh, may evaporate, um, they do that in your oven and not on the lens of the satellite next to you that messes everything up. And then there, there is some campaigns where you torture your satellite and uh, shake it and uh, heat it so you make sure that nothing will come loose uh, during the launch. And then you just send it to the rocket people and you have pizza. Um, on the software side, there was some software that could do communications, but uh, yeah, it needed to be tested and evolve a bit. And uh, then one, once we were happy with what we have, 
we flash the final firmware on the satellite, and then we have pizza. And on the bureaucracy department, um, we had to coordinate frequencies. So what's, what's that? Um, let's say you have a radio, and you decide that you duct tape the push to talk button, and then you put a, like a tape recorder next to it, and say, I am Joe, I am Joe, every second. And then you just pick a frequency, let's say, I'll, I'll just put my birthday in. Okay, and you just start transmitting. And then you get to some kind of military band, and uh, local people around uh, the country don't like it. Ah, imagine that, but the whole planet will not like it. So you need to get a frequency allocated to you. And then there are some managerial staff for exporting this, and what is this, and what is that, and uh, customs people are not happy, and then you have to make them happy with lots of paperwork. They love paperwork. And then have pizza. So all this is good. We can do it, or we think we can do it. And, uh, but why? So what should this <laughs> satellite do? And uh, we realized that there is some kind of a problem that we could try to address. So imagine this. When you, your satellite and many other satellites, and for this size it would be like 50 or 100, go out in space, is the equivalent of uh, going on the top of a hill, have like a jar of marbles, just throw it down hills, go to the next city, and try to, try to pick one which is yours. So there are raiders for this thing, and uh, there are like military um, services that do track all the stuff, but during the first weeks, it's like a blob of stuff. Um, so in order to be able to communicate, you need two things. You, know, you need to know which one is yours, and you need to know where is it. So the first part is quite easy. Because you just uh, wait for the lands, satellites go out, and then you wait, you look up, and uh, at some point you say, um, you big? Okay. Hey, it's me. Oh, nice. Um, can you hear me? Hey, it's me. Okay, where are you? Hey, it's me. <laughs> uh, can you tell me your position? Hey, it's me. <laughs> and then no contact. Luckily, uh, the hey, it's me part, it's identifiable. Because you would have some kind of uh, ID beacon, whatever, that you design, so you know that's, that's yours. The other part, not so easy. But uh, we thought that if we exploit the Doppler effect, because these things go really fast, and really fast is like seven to eight kilometers per second, and to give you like a sense of how fast this is, I will go to the center of the city and come back. So I'm going, I'm back that fast. So the Doppler shift that happens to the transmission from the satellite can help you start identifying uh, the orbit. Uh, there are some, uh, or we call them orbital elements, which define the orbit. I won't bore you with that. but there is a way that you can do that. So, that's the experiment. So, on the hardware, um, we started designing a power system. And uh, so we got a really popular uh, solar harvesting chip that does MPPT, that's the SPV 1040, uh, with some solar panels. We also added a battery management uh, chip, so it uh, actually, it's a battery gauge, so it no knows how many uh, current goes in, goes out. And um, you can get a good sense of what's going on in your power system. Some minor modifications to the, um, to the comms, the communication board. And then we, we designed all the structure that will keep everything together. So regarding the power budget, um, we wrote a tool to do that, because commercial ones are not open and they're very expensive. So this is what this tool produces. You just uh, enter how much uh, solar panels you have, and then you get a really nice plot, which is for each side of the satellite, how, how much power you're getting. And this is awesome, but the thing is, when your satellite is kicked out of the box, because it is um, kind of mounted on the bottom, uh, just flips around, so the reality is something like that. 
Um, so the structure, that's the structure. We designed this uh, for, in the concept of having the PCBs that mount the solar panels and everything to be a structural element. And this is an exploded view. Um, and this is how the systems fit in there. Uh, there was a lot of room because uh, we can have uh, like four PCBs in there base, based on the like standard we try to follow. But we only had the, like a power board and the comps board, so we added two batteries just to be on the safe side. And then just to add weight, so the more heavy you are, the longer you stay up there and the more you pay to have, go up there. Um, so there is a ballast board which has, has uh, some weight to like, reach the top weight you can have on these uh, things. The antenna on the bottom, it's a measuring tape. It's really good on unfolding itself back to shape, whatever you do to it. And uh, th there are actual numbers on that, as you can see. Actually, let me pass this around. So the antenna, we did some simulation for the antenna and the radiation pattern. On the right hand side, you can see how this thing is uh, tied down to the satellite in the stowed configuration. Um, and then we get another goal. And they say, you know what? We have an extra slot for you. And say, okay, we, instead of building one, we just build two. That's great. And then there's the thing with the deployer where you were going in, so can you build it for us? <laughs> so we said yes for some reason, and we came up with the revised plan. So the revised plan also includes the deployer. I won't go into that because that's the next talk, uh, but this was the birth of PicoBus, uh, the deployer we built. So you have to wait like 15 minutes to hear about this. Moving on, we had all the um, circuits and the PCBs ready. Uh, you need to add some kind of conformal coating to protect the stuff. So you spray this and then you inspect it with UV light and uh, it glows and where it doesn't glow, uh, you have to apply more. Quite simple. Uh, this is an almost finished structure. It's a photo from the, um, during the assembly. Um, and these are the two assembled satellites ready to go. So in the ballast board where it's nothing, uh, we thought we could go like, uh, let's put some ideas in there instead. So this is a small board with uh, like uh, the four principles that we believe in regarding uh, space and uh, openness in, uh, in space. We moved on to the, to the bake-out procedure, so that's like um, upside down jar that goes in the vacuum machine thingy and uh, it goes to really, really big, low vacuum. Um, and then there's a, like a, um, a floodlight on the right that does infrared uh, heating of everything there. And uh, what you do is you measure the mass before, you bake it, you measure the mass after, and you have to be within some specs or something really important evaporated in there, so it's a no-go. And the final step was to uh, do the protoflight campaign. This is where you put everything in the deployer, and then you just torture it, and it, it hope, you hope that uh, when you open the deployer again, you don't get sand coming out. <laughs> On the software side, um, we built some drivers for the hardware as a standalone project, so it can be reused uh, for other things. Uh, we built telemetry and telecommand. There was a finite state machine for orchestrating of what the satellite should do. And then, because there was a delay on the launch, uh, the software people, we had like m more time in our hands, so we decided, okay, let, let's add another project. So. There was a new project called Open Space Data Link Protocol, and uh, it's a way to structure your data and telemetry that goes up and down to the satellite. And um, we also built some kind of uh, ground station telecommand software to operate the whole thing. 
Uh, another interesting aspect of the debe development was that uh, while we, the hardware was ready and the, the software was written, uh, we were using the actual ground station software that was going to be used uh, during the mission, which was part of Satnox. So during the development, we had like a, a Satnox dashboard that would give us the state of the satellite. So everything is good and nice because it's next to us. Um, but the good thing is that this is ready. So when satellite goes up, you just reopen this and you have your data. So these are the, like the final steps, final firmware is going in. Uh, everything goes into the deployer for the last time. And then you wait for the launch. The launch provider was Firefly Aerospace. The, um, like the, the, the dream payload was uh, the, um, like the mission we were invited to join. And uh, a few months has passed. And there's the moment that you, you anxiously wait to happen. And uh, it's a very stressful moment because sometimes for, from Firefly, things can go to Fireball. <laughs> and that's what happened. As you can imagine, there were feelings. <laughs> and, uh, well, the only thing you can do, since you know that th since the thing blew up, they will probably going to build another. So we build more cubics. <laughs> and uh, a few months later, or almost a year later, uh, here we go again, <laughs> biting nails, hugging teddy bears. <laughs> uh, and then you get this picture. So that's our deployer in there are the satellites. Uh, Firefly did a good job to interrupt the stream just before we were deployed <laughs> and then do a playback, but not say that it is a playback. So they said all uh, payloads are deployed and you get a video with this thing closed. <laughs> and I said, okay, what happened? But there's a switch there that says, you know, the door has opened. So hopefully things go good and they did. So we started receiving. Uh, telemetry from uh, the satellites. It's cubic three and four because the one and two kind of disintegrated or something. Uh, there was a minor issue, minor, minor issue with uh, the I squared C bus on one of the satellites, but the reset solved this. So that it's not a really nice way to do that. It's kind of windowsy like, but at least it worked. Uh, we attempted uh, some uh, telecommand and control. Uh, the command was received. We wasn't able to get the reply. And the telemetry was received by the Satnox network. So these are like real space data here. Uh, the power system kind of overworked. So the battery was like op continuously full, which is good. Uh, so what do we get out of this? The platform, the cubic platform, was a success. Um, uh, it is considered now TRL-9. TRL-9 TRL is like the, you've been to space and it worked, so it's like the top level. The, there is no pain there, so that's good. Um, Firefly did not reach the uh, target orbit, so this affected the, um, the mission life because it was reduced to three to four days. Uh, we managed to do orbit determination, um, but since the orbit was decaying really fast, it was uh, unusable. It, the information was there, but we, you could not verify it because the next orbit has, was totally messed up. Um, and this gave uh, life to four more projects, uh, Picobus. Sidlock, you should uh, uh, listen about that in uh, 1630. Which, is, uh, with, which does exactly what the experiment is, but in a more like, um, commercial way. Um, and we have the simulator and the space data protocol. So the platform is a one P pocket cube bus, the one that's going around. 
Uh, if you use one battery and you do not use a ballast, you have a, a room for one or two payloads to put in there. Um, you get 350 to 500 milliwatts of generation for your stuff. There's battery monitor and management. Uh, we have a really good documentation. It's currently coming together from the various wiki pages and issues, but it's re really detailed. And uh, it's a cost-effective solution for research, education, radio amateur, or whatever you can imagine. Uh, so what's the future? Um, we need to move comps to like version one and call it that. Uh, create a better power board, uh, finalize a standard, and then create a document about it. And go bigger and fly more cubics. This is all the software that we used. It's all open software. Um, and these are the people that helped this thing to become reality. Thank you very much. <laughs> so if there is time for questions. Five minutes for questions. Uh, how many ground stations and passages do you need to um, like estimate the orbital elements uh, of the satellite? Get a Doppler effect. It's, oh, so how many ground stations and, you, yeah. and passages you need to determine an orbit? Yeah. Okay. Um, obviously, the more the better. But uh, with two or three ground stations and a single passage, you get a, a really good estimate. And then with the following ones, uh, you just kind of nail it, actually. So, yeah, the results. Uh, Actually, you can get more info on the SIDLOC talk about it, which is quite uh, extensive. Yeah. Since you're in here, yeah. <laughs> since you're using CCSTS, you also know the pain of CCSTS, I hope. Uh, have you thought about uh, looking at other like open source uh, space protocols that are already out there, instead uh, of writing it new? <laughs> oh, actually, it is based so uh, the question is uh, whether we thought for uh, all for existing space protocols instead of implementing a new one. Uh, the CCSDS provides some compatibility with uh, commercial uh, equipment, so uh, we thought it was a good idea to go that way. So um, there is an open solution that exists that is compatible with this kind of uh, protocol. Okay, thank you very much for an amazing talk. Um, Oh, it worked. Nice. If I can ask one last question, um, yeah. or at least one more in any case. Um, did you have any considerations for radiation effects in your um, design of the hardware um, and any mitigations in that sense? Okay, so the question is whether we had any consideration for the radiation effects on the hardware. Um, when you fly what we call commercial of the self components, uh, you know that they are not space hardened. So there is always a chance for something going wrong. But you can go around uh, by designing in a like, more clever way. For example, um, MOSFETs may uh, latch themselves, but if you have a monitoring circuit that uh, detects that and you power cycle the entire thing, most of the times, you, get, you, you can uh, get out of this situation. For the software, which is also quite important, uh, there was a, um, like a triple storage uh, technique implemented for all the variables and the um, information in the satellite. So also there was an ECC uh, RAM, the ECC RAM used from the micro microcontroller. And there was a polling, so you read three values and you choose the, like the two that match, and this is it. And there, there is also scrubbing, uh, frequently scrubbing, where you, you read everything and the, you rewrite it. So even there is an error, you have, have corrected it and then put the correct information in all places. Okay, so Ilis will be available for questions outside. Of course. We have three more minutes. Oh, great. Excellent. Then maybe uh, maybe maybe two more questions. We had we had one be right before. Is all the way. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, about the ground stations. Uh, did you 
build your own ground stations or there's like a network that you can use or how this works because it looks like the most expensive part of the project is like uh, you have to grab you know whole planet okay so the question is uh, did we build our own ground station or did we use ground station network uh, the simple answer is satnogs the more uh, uh, detailed answer is that we ha actually our first really first project was a ground station network it now has around uh, five 500 stations around the world it's operated by contributors so we have like a really good coverage uh, in the UHF band and uh, also on the upper bands too hello thank you for the talk uh, two brief questions um, did you have a uh, an attitude controlled system for the cubic or it was not needed and uh, same thing for thermal management was important or in the design okay so the question is did we have an attitude control system and was there any thermal management so the first question is no we just toss it out there and let it spin <laughs> um, it was not important for the experiment so and also there was no time as you might have realized for the thermal management, there were some tests in vacuum chambers, and uh, we saw that uh, it would uh, survive without needing like an extra provision uh, for that. Of course, the PCB design is uh, built in a way where you dissipate all the heat from the components to the PCB, um, but that's kind of best practice anyway. And uh, the temperatures we got from the telemetry were actually well within the automotive limit, so we were good. Okay, thank you. Um, any additional questions, we can go in the hallway. Sorry.